Hey everyone, Fire here, and today I'm going to be bringing you the first of three videos that will teach you how to farm a mage blood in a new league. A brief disclaimer before we start. If you're not putting in upwards of 16 hours a day, you don't have a very high level of knowledge, and you're not putting an intense amount of practice into your league start, you're probably not going to get a day 3 to 5 mage blood. That said, these are still the best strategies available to you, and I've handpicked these ones because they're not going to be ruined by a lot of people doing them. The premise of this strategy is finding a really good layout map and then running Gilded Blight Scarabs. We do this to farm Blighted maps, but also because these Blight Encounters are going to drop Anointed Jewelry, which we can then use the oil extractors that we're getting on in order to gain gold and silver oils back out of this Anointed Jewelry. On top of all this, we're going to run Metamorph Scarabs, and the reason for this is that there is no opportunity cost associated with doing so. You can pop the Metamorph and then complete the Metamorph while you're doing the Blight Encounter. This means that you pay a small amount for a Scarab, and you just make pure profit. There's no extra time added to the map, which means you're just earning tons of Catalysts, which, which can be bulk sold for quite a lot of money early on in the league. Most of the money from this strategy comes from the Catalysts, the Blight Maps, and the Gold and Silver Oils. So don't really worry about the lower tier oils, you're going to end up with absolutely thousands of them, but that's fine. You can delete them, you can let them sit in your stash, you can try and trade them up all the way up to Opalescent and then sell those. It doesn't really matter what you do with them, they're not going to make up a very large portion of your money. I know Excellence is going to tell you that they are, but they're not. The builds I would recommend for this strat come down to Skeleton Mages, Seismic Traps, or pretty much any variant of Tornado Shot. Now I do have to stress that if you're playing Seismic Traps, you need to be investing high enough for a Sangonate to be able to kill normal mobs, and in some cases rare mobs, because you're going to need to save your Seismic Traps for the Blight Bosses when they come up. Seismic Traps is going to have the most trouble out of all of these options dealing with the Blight Waves if you don't have a high enough investment, so kind of be wary of that, and if you are picking Seismic Traps, definitely practice this strat before you pull it off. If your build isn't listed here, I would really recommend writing a question in the comments querying me about this, because there are a lot of popular builds that just don't cut it. Cyclone is terrible, most minion builds surprisingly are actually terrible at this because they can't handle the high level of health of juiced Blight Bosses, you have things such as Detonate Dead, which absolutely struggles, Lightning Strike, which struggles. So ask me if you're not sure, but these are the ones that I would consider safe, and these are the ones that I've personally tested and can assure you work. We've set this farm up by running Epidemiology for the increased amount of Blight Maps dropped from our Blight Chests. We're going to be running Mycelial Swarm. This is going to give you a 20% chance for an additional Blight Encounter, but it's important to also know that you can't naturally spawn additional Blights into your map. So don't, don't try and look for maps that have the extra Blight implicit. Don't look for the Sextant that in, uh, spawns an extra Blight Encounter. This doesn't work. You could only spawn one Blight Encounter into a map, and then Mycelial Swarm is the only way to get the second one. In. We're also going to be running Distilled Fungus. This is the thing that gives us the Anointed Jewelry and the Oil Extractor. This, in fact, is one of the most strongest notables on the entire Atlas Passive Tree. This is going to be a very significant source of money over time. When it comes to Blight, Scarabs Gilded is always better than the lower tier ones, so you should only be buying Gilded unless there is not enough supply. When it comes to Metamorph Scarabs, however, you have a choice between Gilded or Rusted. This just comes down to what the bulk prices for Gilded are in the early days of the league. Gilded Blight's always going to be worth it, but Gilded Metamorph may be a little too expensive to justify the increase in price. So, you're probably going to end up doing Gilded Blight plus Rusted Metamorph in most cases. Now, you can complement these farms with these compass effects that greatly enhance the amount of oils and catalysts you're receiving from this farm but there is a big problem here you're going to have a very limited supply early in the league and you're also probably not going to be able to handle the increased level of difficulty that these compass effects introduce so you're going to have to constantly reevaluate this for yourself and make a lot of tough calls when it comes to figuring out whether you're fitting this in or not you are going to have to live search these in a lot of cases so have a good think about this and figure out when and where you're going to fit these into your farms, but I absolutely recommend working towards them as the oil one in particular is basically tripling the amount of oils you're getting naturally from Blight Chest and the Catalyst reward is just an insane amount of free profit guaranteed every single map. The way you actually run these maps is that you're going to clear the map leaving the Blight to last if that could be achieved efficiently. The reason for this is that you want to then spawn the Metamorph and kill it while you're waiting for the Blight monster spawns, and by leaving the Blight encounter to last, you're going to clear the rest of the map and have all of the Metamorph parts available. 
these encounters are going to drop a lot of annoying to jewelry and also oil extractors. For efficiency, I would actually recommend banking up all of this anointed jewelry, put it in a tab, and then at some point later on when you're free, maybe you're eating, you can actually go through this and have my spreadsheet open and compare all of the anoints against the spreadsheet to figure out which ones have gold or silver oils as a component, because this will allow the oil extractors you're dropping to give you back gold or silver oils. Something I discovered and I was very surprised about is that oil extractors are not affected by weighting. That means that if you have an anoint that has a gold and a clear oil, you have a 50% chance to get back a gold oil out of that anoint. This is really good, in fact, but I really have to recommend that you do not try and buy the extractors and you don't buy the jewelry items, and also don't try and sell the jewelry items. Making these individual trades is going to be very time consuming, and although you may increase the amount of profit per item that you're getting from this, you're not increasing your overall profit per hour, you're actually decreasing it. It's just not worth it. So only use the oil extractors that you pick up for yourself and only use the anointed jewelry that you pick up for yourself any excess just ignore it delete it sell it to a vendor i don't care what you do with it but it's really not worth handling it individually Although you can pick up all of the additional blight and metamorph stuff on the tree, it's not really recommended because it adds an, either a disproportionate amount of difficulty or the opportunity cost to spend those atlas passives on that stuff is just too high when early on in the league you need to focus on things such as map sustain. This strategy just doesn't work if you aren't able to sustain the kind of map that you want to run and so it all falls apart. I really wouldn't recommend going for all of this extra stuff unless you absolutely can afford it. But then again, if you're doing this strategy efficiently, you don't have a fully completed atlas, you have killed all the endgame bosses yet so in an ideal scenario you actually can't afford to go for all of this additional blight and metamorph stuff figuring out the ideal map to run for this strategy is actually quite difficult. Now, Toxic Sewers is the default best map in a lot of cases, and the main reason for this is that it has a very enclosed layout. You're able to run it, and you're able to see at a distance where the Blight Encounter is, and then you're able to figure out an efficient path through the rest of the Toxic Sewers so that you can full clear it and then end up at the Blight Encounter last, and then have all of your metamorph parts available. The big problem with this is that if Toxic Sewers at tier 16 is gated behind four Void Stones, well, all of a sudden we have a problem because I don't think it's really feasible to get your build to a point where it can do all four of the endgame bosses that are required to get the four Void Stones in order to do this farm. So you may want to find a different map. For the uninitiated, the reason why we like to use maps that have a lot of narrow laneways in them and don't have a lot of open areas is because Blight encounters are always guaranteed to have one lane that gives only Blight rewards. And if you pick a very narrow map, you can get Blights spawning in an, a location where there's only one lane available for the Blight. This means that all of the chests on that lane are going to be Blight rewards, and this is how you get six to eight Blight chests in a single map. This is how some people, including myself, are able to get 10 or 11 blighted maps from just one tier 16 map. Overgrown Shrine, Waste Pool, Core, and Phantasmagoria are all examples of viable maps, but they're not the only ones, so there are plenty of others out there that you can find through your own theory crafting. It's not particularly hard, you just have to think of maps that have a lot of narrow lanes and hallways in them, and then you're probably going to find a good map. Good maps don't always have single lane blights. If you do Toxic Sewers, you'll find that the single lane blights are actually a, a semi-rare, they're just less rare than with every other map, so don't get too caught up on this sort of thing. If you have to run blight, your blight encounters in a really bad map for other reasons, just do it and don't think twice about it because you're still going to overall be obtaining a very high amount of exalts per hour. There are two main requirements for pulling the strategy off. The first is being able to sustain your desired map pool. Now this past patch that was Toxic Sewers and Waste Pool because they were adjacent to each other. There are various bonuses associated with adjacent map drops, I'm not going to get into all of them now, but this made it a lot easier. With the upcoming Atlas Shuffle, we may not get two maps that are adjacent to each other that are good for Blight, which may make it a lot harder. So you're going to have to research into the Atlas Shuffle and do some figuring out for yourself to find a map that might be adjacent to another good map. You're also going to have to unlock enough favorited map slots, so I recommend once you've picked your build, figure out how many favorited map slots you think you can unlock early in a league and plan around that. Then you're also going to need to get enough Atlas progression to unlock enough Atlas passives to increase your map drops to sustain the pool of maps that you've chosen. The second requirement is being able to beat almost all of the Blight encounters you come across. When I farmed my second Mage Blood this league, I was fa I was failing around 30% and still earning a very high amount of exalts per hour in terms of profit. So don't stress it if you're failing some, but do stress it if you're failing about half or more of them, because that's when it's going to just start wasting too much of your time to be worth it. Now, in order to beat most of these encounters, you need to have a very good level of gear. You're going to do this by 
running infinite heist on day one of the league. We'll talk a bit more about that later. You're also going to need to pick a very good league starter. I've gone into that. If you pick Lightning Strike or Cyclone, you're absolutely cooked. You're not going to be able to farm these maps, so just don't do it. And finally, you're going to be able to. You're going to need to test and practice this strat with a tower strat. So pick your league starter. Pick a level of gear that you think is appropriate for day two, day three of a league, and then figure out the tower strategy based on the recommendations I'm going to go through soon, and start testing out to see whether you're actually having trouble or not, because that's going to be a good indication as to whether you need to increase the amount of gear that you get by day two or day three, or whether you are overestimating it, and you can actually start this strategy off earlier. The ideal strategy is very simply to just build tier 3 towers in every lane and choke point. You're going to then add tier 3 chilling towers on top of that to improve the efficacy of the amount of CC you're getting. Now, don't swap these around. Chilling towers are weaker than seismic towers, and to my knowledge, tier 3 chilling towers are limited by mob count, which means if you're in a 1 or 2 lane encounter, tier 3 chilling towers are doing almost nothing for you unless you build lots of them. So... Priority is tier 3 seismic, then tier 3 chilling. Finally, you can build a tier 4 imbuing near the pump, so that anything that gets too close to the pump, you can focus fire down with a huge buff to your damage. You do want to experiment around and see if there are other setups that work for you. I do know some builds that prefer other setups, but they're kind of niche. I'm not going to mention them here. You, you can figure these out for yourself for the most part with like 5 to 10 minutes worth of experimentation. Your biggest priority when it comes to ring annoyance is getting the one that causes your chilling towers to freeze enemies for 0.2 seconds. You get this by using a silver or opal oil, so you're not going to have it initially, but you're going to be able to make one of these yourself without using the trade site pretty early on. You then want to complement this with one of the annoyance that busts your seismic or your chilling towers that's listed here. I've tested them all, they all kind of felt good, I can't really say one of them felt better than the other, so I think the play is probably to just go for the cheapest one, and that off the top of my head would be the one that increases the effect of chill from your chilling towers. Now, some of you are probably wondering why we're not running the increased action speed from temporal towers, this is a very popular one, but the reason we're not going to run it is because very early in a league, you don't have two gold oils to spare, and even if you did, I would probably just recommend selling them, because in most cases, you don't need this. On top of that, Action speed doesn't benefit a lot of the builds that are good for this, so I don't believe the Temporal Towers grant the action speed to your minions. I think it only grants it to you, and this also means that if you're playing one of the variants of Tornado Shot that uses Ballistas, your Ballistas aren't benefiting from the increased action speed, so none of this is really good for most of the builds that want to be doing this strat. So if you've identified a specific situation where you think it's good for you and you think you could get away with it, fine, do it. But once you then also involve the plus one oil tier section, you have halved resources basically, or rather doubled costs. So that means that you're not going to get any benefit from your anoint until you build your first tier four tower. If you're running a one lane encounter, you're not going to be able to build this until very late into the encounter. It's going to guarantee that you just lose for free. So I really, really, really have to recommend you don't build this. Let's spend a bit of time talking about the amount of preparation that has to go into pulling this off. This is the sort of preparation you're going to be doing if you want a day 3 Mage Blood. If you're more happy to just get Mage Blood during the second or the third week of the league, you don't really have to worry about a lot of this stuff. But basically, the beginning of your preparation comes down to testing the strat on a high investment 3.17 character to familiarize yourself with the amount of loot that you're going to be getting, how the oil extractor works, the difficulty of the juiced blights at various levels of Atlas passive point investment. You also want to suss out the frequency of the one and two lane blights. A lot of people think that if you run toxic sewers, you're just going to get one lane blight encounters every map. That's not the case. So you want to become familiar with how many you're getting on average from toxic sewers. So that when you start to test other maps, you're kind of comfortable getting them say one in every 10 maps because you know that that's actually not that much worse than running toxic sewers. You also want to test out your tower strategies. The second part of this testing is then taking one of the recommended league starters, putting it together on the current patch, and then putting about 10 exalts worth of investment into the character, and then retesting these blight encounters. See if your league starter that you want to do the strategy with can do these blight encounters at 10 exalts worth of investment. Now, if they can't, it means you may need to reevaluate how you're investing those 10 exalts. You may need to invest more than 10 exalts, or you may want to pick a different build. Step number three is to shave away that investment until you find a sweet spot between the difficulty of the blight encounters that you're doing and also the budget that you're comfortable running. So some players are going to be comfortable running a 20 or 30 exalt budget build on day two of the league. Other people still just want to have a two or three exalt character. Now that's fine. You just have to find the sweet spot for yourself and that's why I'm covering preparation. 
Keep in mind, you can remove Atlas passives that are increasing the difficulty of the blind encounter. You don't have to use a Saxon if it's too hard. And the final thing I'd recommend is also picking a less optimal map for Blight. The one lane encounters are by far the hardest part of Blight. If you're going to fail every one that you come across, just suck it up and run a worse map so that you never get the one lane encounters. Because being able to clear a Blight that has eight lanes is still better than failing a Blight with one lane. You're going to get much less out of that. So that's what I would recommend doing there. The next step is to start practicing your campaign times for your chosen league starter. The league starter you've chosen is probably not one that you've practiced the campaign with recently, so it's a really good thing to just go back and try and get that time under 5 or 6 hours at absolute worst. You don't want it taking 8 to 10, that's really going to hinder you and it's going to throw your entire schedule off. It's, it's just a very bad thing to do for a lot of reasons, so get as much practice in as possible here until you're happy with your times. Final part of your preparation is going to be practicing infinite heisting with Chaos Recipe farming. This video is going to be way too long to cover how infinite heisting works. There are other videos out there that cover this, but basically we're going to be doing infinite heisting because you need a lot of currency in order to put together a character capable of actually completing these blight encounters, and infinite heist just happens to be the most efficient way of actually doing this. Now let's talk about what your day 1-5 to five schedule is going to look like. To start with, when a leak launches, you want to realign your sleep schedule, if possible, so that you wake up 2 hours before the leak launches. You want to do this so that you can get in queue, then you want to have breakfast, take a shower maybe, and mentally freshen up before the leak starts, because you're going to be putting in, preferably, a 16 plus hour slog. If you're unable to realign your sleep schedule because you have work after the weekend, that's fine. This part's helpful, but it's not necessary. You want to get to Act 10 within 4-6 to six hours of launch, but instead of completing the campaign, you're then going to spend the next 4-8 to eight hours infinite heisting. You have to do your research here. Don't just buy items as soon as they come up. You do need to run live searches, but if one of your upgrades comes up for an exalt, and you've done your research and you know that this particular item is not meta enough to warrant being an exalt it's not rare enough to warrant being an, being an exalt and that the seller is probably going to have to drop their item to 30c you know over the next 20 minutes if they want to get a sale just hold out but you're not going to know this if you don't do your research and if you don't be diligent basically so definitely spend some time on Peewee Antiquary and other sites, figuring out the historical prices of all of the upgrades, plan out all of your POBs progressively, know what every single upgrade for every slot is going to be at every point, and in what order they should come in given various price points. This is going to take a lot of time, this is the hardest part of preparation, this infinite heisting bracket where you are pausing your progression to get a ton of currency, but then you also have to spend that currency extremely efficiently and wisely, otherwise you just break your entire league start, and there's no point even spending the time to watch this video, because you've screwed yourself over. Okay, after all that's done, you're going to then finish off Act 10, you're going to progress your Atlas briefly, but you're not really going to care about trying to sustain your maps or anything like that, you're only trying to farm levels and Atlas passives, so run maps that you don't have already the Atlas passive for, or completion for rather, and try and stay alive, obviously don't take too many risks, you don't really care about currency, so you don't have to go popping legion monoliths and stuff like that that's going to get you killed. You only want to level up here and you only want to get Atlas passives. Once you're happy with that progression, you're then going to go buy a tier 16 map. While you were infinite icing, everyone else was progressing their Atlas, there are a bunch of players already selling their spare tier 16 maps. This will cost you probably 16 to 20 C, but that's fine. You're going to take this tier 16 map, you're going to slap a couple of scarabs in there, you're going to put a deli orb on it, you're going to activate a master mission, and you're going to activate a Zana mod. You're then going to juice the hell out of this one map, and that hopefully will drop a few other red maps in return. You're then going to juice the hell out of these other maps that drop, maybe not as hard, maybe not with the deli orb, although there will be some cheap deli orbs, so that's something you want to consider, and then eventually you're going to be able to snowball your red map pool right off the rip. So you're skipping all of the early red map progression and some of the late yellow map progression in a lot of cases, and just going straight to T16, and then you're going to finish off your Atlas progression from there, because you do need to unlock Eater of Worlds and the Exarch in a lot of cases, you want the favorite map slots, you need the Void Stones sometimes, so, but this is how you're going to do it, you're going to Infinite Heist, then you're going to get levels and Atlas passives, and then just skip right ahead, and all of those hours that you lost from Infinite Heisting, you're going to make up for in one go, and then you're also going to have way more gear than all of the other people already at Tier 16. Once you've got a Tier 16 map pool going, you can start to think about going to bed and ending day one, but before you do, you need to put a lot of thought into how you're going to get started on day two. Ideally, you're going to start farming as soon as possible after you wake up on day two, but to do that, you need to have your entire setup going. It's not enough to just be geared and at tier 16 maps, you need to have some favorited slots, you need to have the ability to sustain the desired map pool. So you might need void stones, you might 
need to kill endgame bosses in order to do all this sort of stuff, look into maybe buying a carry from one of the players who are rolling a boss killer. You can do this from TFT. There are streamers that are going to sell carries, this sort of thing. Do your research and figure this out. Don't stretch your first day out too long, however. Now, it is great to do all of your goals in one day, but that doesn't mean doing a 26-hour day. I know because I've actually done both ways, right? I've done a 28-hour day one a couple of times or things close to that, and I've also done shorter day ones. I've had a lot more success doing the shorter day ones. When you do the 28-hour day one, you end up just being really groggy on day two then during day two you're going to need to take frequent naps because your body's just not going to be able to handle the sleep deprivation you're also going to be unfocused and you're going to be making bad decisions you're going to be dying to things that you shouldn't be doing you're just going to be playing very inefficiently and using your time incorrectly on top of this you have to consider that the economy is lagging very behind where you are so you're finishing day one in t16 maps fully geared you're at where a lot of people are going to be at in two weeks time now, you have to consider that there are a lot of middle tier players also, though, that are just finishing the campaign and still in white and yellow maps. So it's okay to just go to sleep and give them time to catch up because by letting them catch up, you're going to wake up to a trade site that's suddenly populated with all the scarabs you need, all of the sextants you need, all of the things that you need to start farming. But if you beat everyone there, you're going to be the only one with access to this stuff. So you can't go to the trade site to buy them from other people because you're the only person that was able to drop them in the first place. So. When you're done with most of the stuff that you need to do on day one, just convert all your chaos to exalted orbs, log out, and go to sleep. Don't drink too many energy drinks or do anything that might increase the amount of caffeine in your body and stuff like this. When you go to sleep, you want to go to sleep as soon as possible. If you stay up restlessly tossing and turning because you're thinking about the league, you're going to not only lose valuable hours, but you're then still going to end up waking up the next day really groggy and playing inefficiently. Day two is the hard part. This is make or break. This is everything you've been preparing for. So on the morning of day two, you're going to wake up and you're going to start scanning the bulk scarab prices briefly. You probably want to do this while you eat breakfast. You want to have a good think about what you're going to be doing for the rest of the day. You want to plan out basically exactly what you're going to be doing as soon as you sit down at the computer, what things you need to accomplish before you can start farming blight. Now, you do need to make a lot of tough decisions here. You need to decide whether gilded blight and meta scarabs are viable right off the bat or whether you need to go for cheaper options maybe you need to compromise your strategy a little bit because things didn't turn out the way you planned maybe you thought you would do better and be faster at getting to where you wanted to be that's fine make these decisions while you eat breakfast take take as much time as you need to really if you need to have a half an hour or one hour breakfast that's fine because the time that you're spending here making these decisions is then going to save you a lot of time and a lot of bad decision making further down the road so it's worth giving up this time basically okay try to start farming your blight strategy as soon as possible but make sure that you've done everything that you need to do so that you're not interrupted later you don't want to rush into blight farming as soon as you have access to tier 16 maps but then find that you then run out of maps you're unable to sustain your pool then you're gonna have to start buying and you're gonna have to start you, you just scuff the entire process at this point because at this point you're just chasing your tail you didn't prepare adequately and you're going to be playing very inefficiently for the next three four five six hours it's really not worth playing this way so make sure that before you start farming you are ready to farm uninterrupted potentially for the next 12 to 16 hours Okay, so the next thing you want to do is delay liquidating as much as possible on day two. Now, the reason for this is that the blight maps and the oils are going to steadily rise in demand over the course of the day. There are a lot of people who are playing bots that are going to want to farm blight maps, and they still have to get their characters through the campaign. Bots are pretty slow, and even if the humans are playing it because they rely on botting, they're often not that good at the game. So you're going to get a lot more mileage out of selling your stuff later on in day two versus early on the only reason you would actually want to liquidate anything on day two is because you need the cash if you don't have the amount of money required to just buy a whole bunch of gilded blight scarabs and get started then you may need to liquidate to do this this was one of the great difficulties i encountered when farming deli orbs last league i constantly had to liquidate on day two and three of the league to fund further investment since it was it became very expensive at one point you can circumvent a lot of these problems by just farming a little longer in, in infinite heist so when you're doing your infinite heist farm enough to get all of your upgrades and then farm a little extra so that you can buy a bunch of blight scarabs and keep yourself busy for the day without having to be interrupted with liquidation now all of the stuff that you're going to be selling is going to often outpace the hyperinflation that happens on day two of the league so yeah just delay it as long as possible only liquidate if you absolutely have to and try to spend the entire day farming 
the more time you spend farming, the better. Once you're tired out and you don't have the mental energy to keep going and farming Blight, that's the point that you liquidate on day two. You convert all of your Chaos Orbs into Exalt and then you log into, you convert them into Exalts and then you log off for the day. Day three to five is far more relaxed. You've put all this preparation into getting this strategy going and now it's on maintenance mode. You wake up, you eat your breakfast, you think about what's going to happen throughout the day, but the main goal is to just spend 16 hours roughly farming the strat. You wanna try and keep interruptions to an absolute minimum. Take the breaks that you need to, liquidate before you go to sleep, but otherwise you're just farming. You do want to have live searches open for the Apothecary card and the Mage Blood, and you do want to be aware of whether the card is coming up at a rate that's too expensive. If the Mage Blood's cheaper, just save to buy a Mage Blood outright. That's how we've been doing it for the past two leagues. So, <coughs> so doing that for another league is not going to be the worst. The final thing I want to mention here is that this strategy is very unpopular and it's also very difficult. I put Tripolar Bear onto a version of this strategy midway through last league, and he had a juiced out Forbidden Right Totem build. He was not able to kill the juiced Metamorphs, as an example, right? So, not a lot of people are going to be doing this farm. If you prepare for it, and you prepare a character capable of doing this sort of stuff, obviously, maybe not with all the extra added difficulty, you're going to be one of the only people able to access these rewards in these quantities. So there's no way doing this farm is not going to be profitable. Even if everyone watching this video decides that they're going to do this farm, it's still going to be profitable. So don't waste the time trying to crunch numbers and figure out whether you're turning a sufficient amount of money or not. This is always going to be profitable. There's no scenario ever where doing this farm is not going to work out. On top of that, bots are buying the blighted maps bots are farming the blighted maps so whenever bots are involved you can guarantee this profit you know then they're, they're not going to keep doing this if it wasn't profitable and because bots don't care about their time they're going to buy at whatever price things come up at so this is always this is always going to have a very high amount of demand the supply is never going to meet the amount of demand so you can always price your things at way more than what it's costing you to generate them this entire slide presentation as well as a spreadsheet shopping list is going to be contained in the description below. If you like this video, give me a like, comment, and subscribe. And otherwise, just stay tuned for two more videos pretty much on the exact same topic of how to farm a mage blood very early on in the league. See you guys next time.